In my bed, I am wrapped in my cosy blanket. All around me, the usually nighttime set. Darkness surrounds me as I drift into sleep. Not a single sound from the world, not even a peep. A cold shiver crawls its way down my spine. My eyes widen, taking in every detail, rough and fine. I observe every shadow, looking for a movement. Not a single moment wasted. Everyone wisely spent. No sound emitted from the open window. And another shiver from a cold wind's blow. I contemplate over the shadows, some too dark from the rest. Each moment threatening to break me, putting my fear to the test. A creak sounds from a corner, forming a new feeling of horror. I pulled the sheets far over my head and huddled my limbs into the center of the bed. I waited and waited for a long time. I peeked and the clock said two on the dime. My eyes adjusted and I could see the silhouette of something. My heart was thumping. I reached for the lamp, and when the light was on, I saw nothing. Sit back and relax with your favorite drink, my dear, dear friends, because now it's time to listen. Night is a beautiful time when terrors come out to play, whether from your own mind or reality. Crime is more prevalent, ghosts are easier to see, monsters lurk under beds. But how can we know for sure what's real or not? What is actually more terrifying? The idea of someone sneaking into our homes and hiding in a corner. Or a monster made of shadow and glowing eyes and gleaming teeth, waiting for us to drop a toe off the edge of the bed. I guess it really depends on who you might ask. To a child, a monster in the closet is easier to understand and be terrified of than a burglar who might stab you when caught. These are just some of the thoughts that trickle through my mind as I lay there desperately wanting to sleep. I couldn't deny that I felt uneasy, uncomfortable. As most people do, I had trouble falling asleep in an unfamiliar place. It didn't help that this small hotel was home to rumors of crime and ghosts alike. If only there had been another motel open, I would have switched to one that didn't have such a sordid reputation. I would consider myself average when it comes to fears and horror. Not all scary movies actually frighten me, but I wasn't immune to craving a cute, childish comedy afterwards in order to clean my palate before sleeping. I didn't believe everything I heard about superstitions or urban legends, but I maintained a curiosity for hearing stories while also attempting to avoid putting myself into any situation that could cause supernatural ideation. Sure, I believe ghosts could be real, but I didn't put much stock in every ghost story I heard. I suppose I could be considered a skeptical believer. I never doubted that things could happen to people, but at the same time, I never saw anything that made me think there was a heavy truth to the forces not of this world. I sure as hell wouldn't risk it, though. <laughs> I won't walk those supposedly haunted woods at night. There's no way I'm going into that old, creaky, abandoned house. And Ouija boards? <laughs> Not a chance. I did believe, though, that rumors of crime and odd occurrences held weight and could mar an establishment's reputation. In such a small city as this, you wouldn't think there could be much of a bad part of town as it were. But there is. 
And that's where I found myself. In all reality, my worries were probably only caused by the chats with the locals I had just a few short hours before at the restaurant across town. The city I was spending the night in on my journey west had a population of around 23,000. It wasn't very large, but it was growing and appeared to be expanding rapidly. There were plenty of hotels and motels in the area, but being a popular tourist destination and it being a big holiday weekend, the specific town I stopped in was mostly book solid, aside from a simple Motel 6 on the south edges of the town. I decided to stop too late in the evening to convince myself to drive even one more mile to a nearby town for more availability options. When I walked into the front office of the motel, a bored older man sat behind the counter, and I immediately recognized the air of third-rate employees and even worse patrons. I would only be here a single night though, so I'd deal with it. I procured a room towards the back of the building. It was on the second floor, but I didn't have much for luggage that would need to be brought, so I didn't mind. After paying and thanking the man behind the counter, I drove around to the back and found what would be my sleeping sanctuary for the night. The air inside the room was stale and a little too warm to be comfortable. I unlocked the window and shoved it to the side begging a breeze to waft through the screen and eliminate the atmosphere of empty dreams and broken hearts. The sad and disgusting reality of what might happen on a regular basis in this motel room seeped into my pores and mingled with the two days on the road that made me feel grimy and unclean. I felt a little better after I took a shower and put on some fresh clothes, though. It was late, almost ten, but I decided to see about finding something to eat. I hopped back in my car and drove to the north side of the city, where I'd seen a plethora of shops and restaurants. I settled on a barbecue joint that seduced me by the delicious smell it exuded into the air around it. I took my place at the bar and ordered a drink while perusing the menu. Throughout my wait, <clears throat> throughout my wait for my meal and the meal itself. I casually talked with a bartender and a few locals who perched themselves in my area. It was all light-hearted conversation until I was asked what hotel I was in. When I answered, the bartender and the man to my left shared a look that prompted me to ask what was wrong with the motel. For the rest of the night, my temporary friends explained to me that the motel I would be staying in was known for its drug dealers and lax policies on calling the police. Rumors of prostitution rings would spark up every so often, and it was a known fact that a few people had died in various rooms from causes ranging from heart attacks, overdoses, drug deals gone wrong, and jealous spouses catching their cheating significant others. They added in some of the stories of the ghost that was said to hang around and spook those who stayed, including a kid who drowned in the pool, a man who axed his wife when he found her with her lover before the lover got hold of the axe and killed the man himself, and a young woman who was known to approach people offering her body only to disappear after being let into their room. The worst story of them all, the one that really set me on edge was the one about the local man who escaped the nearby mental hospital after killing his two brothers, sister, father, and almost finishing his mother off. Apparently, he had just snapped one day while his parents were out of town. Having mental disabilities, he lived with his parents even at the age of 32. With them out of town, his siblings took turns stopping by and keeping an eye on him. Somehow, he managed to kill each of them before his parents returned home, at which time they came upon the bodies of their children in the large freezer that kept in the garage. Upon the discovery, the mother phoned the police and the mentally deranged man pounced on his dad, 
bludgeoning him to death with a sledgehammer. When the police arrived, they found the man, a crazed look in his eyes, slicing his father's body into sections to add to the freezer. His mother had been hit in the head and was severely bleeding, but the responders were able to get her to the hospital in time. She would recover slowly, but still make it. When the officers arrested the man, it was reported he kept licking the blood off his fingers and muttering things over and over. Depending on who you ask, what he muttered varies, but each account and tale agree that he was murmuring something about being told of the sweetest meat, being the helper of someone, that she would be happy with his sacrifice and that only the best would be worthy of her. The man was being kept at a mental facility that really didn't have the means and proper security to contain someone such as him. He'd managed to escape in less than a week, leaving three people with chunks bitten out of their arms and legs. He was tracked down to where he was hiding out, in a room of the very motel I would be sleeping in. The person occupying the room was found deceased in a horrifying manner, and the man was shot in the chest when he lunged towards an officer. Ever since that event, it is said that the ghost of the man appears in the room he had hidden in. Room 103. Also, the ghost of the woman he brutally murdered there is said to roam in the grounds, weeping and whispering. Of course... Most local tales speak of only the deranged psychotic man's ghost. After people continually abandoned room 103, screaming, and rumors began flying, stating that people mysteriously died in the room, the motel stopped renting it out. It has remained empty for almost ten years, from what I was told. I turned over onto my side the thin sheets rustling and scratching against the bare skin of my arms. Oh, it's just a local legend, I assured myself, not able to keep the thoughts of the crazed killer and ghosts out of my head. You're more likely to get shanked by a dealer or methed out junkie than you are to see the ghost of a crazy murderer. Besides, you're on the second floor in the back. His room is on the first floor in the front. You're nowhere near it. I sighed to myself, my thoughts trying to turn to the idea of a drug-addicted person breaking in to steal what they could. I pushed the thought out of my mind and focused on the journey for the next day. I couldn't escape a nagging chill that grasped my spine and caused me to freeze and stop breathing at any little noise, though. A crisp breeze drifted through the window I'd left open, and I sat up in bed. It's just noises from outside, and the cold is probably not helping. Just get up, shut the window, and you'll be fine. I began pulling the blanket off of my body, when I heard the faintest whisper float to my ears on the soft wind. Don't shut the window. My eyes darted to the window, and there, at the edge of the side furthest from the door, was a sliver of shadow. It looked like it belonged to the silhouette of a person. I jumped out of the bed as silently as I could and stared. The image moved very slowly in the direction of the door, crossing more into view. I could see it was the shape of a woman, small and thin. I heard the whisper again. Don't shut the window. This time it sounded like it was accompanied by a forlorn sobbing. I took two steps towards the door, grabbing the first thing I could off of the table so I had some sort of weapon. I glanced down at what I'd grabbed. My keys were clutched tight in my fingers, and I mentally thanked whatever force there was in the world that I hadn't grabbed my sunglasses. I flipped open the tiny keychain knife and held it ready to jab at whoever was outside. 
I closed my eyes tight and took a deep breath, preparing myself for my next move. After a third repetition of the whisper, I opened my eyes, hastily flipped the lock and yanked the door open, taking a step outside, knife at the ready. I found no one. I looked up and down the outside corridor, and there was no sign of anyone. My car sat in the lot below, mostly alone except for another couple of vehicles at least five rooms down. There was no door shutting, no footsteps to be heard, no more sobbing. The wind picked up in a short gust, the bitter cold forcing me to shiver involuntarily. I stepped back in, shaking my head at myself. Those stories are just getting to you. There was no whispering, you buffoon. It's just the wind. Just go the hell to sleep and you'll feel better in the morning. I rolled my eyes at my paranoia and locked the door. I gripped the window and slid it to the side, locking it back in place as well, before setting my keys back on the table and returning to bed. I snuggled under the uncomfortable blanket and shut my eyes, letting out one last sigh. A moment later, my breath caught in my lungs, as I heard a scuffling sound coming from the direction of the bathroom. My eyes shot open and I listened intently as the soft scraping sound approached my bed. My back was to the direction of the sound and I was frozen, unable to turn over and look at what could be causing it. I quickly recognized the sounds as steps and something being dragged. I listened, my heart pounding so loudly I almost couldn't hear the noises over the blood rushing past my ears. Step. Drag. Step. Drag. A wet cough crossed with a chuckle broke me from my immobile state, and I sat up, turning to look at the visage of a man approaching the bed. The light from outside glared through the window and illuminated the figure. It was a man who appeared to be in his forties, disheveled, with dark murky splotches all over his clothes. He was missing his right arm, but his left hand held an axe that was being loosely lugged across the floor. Blood streamed constantly in a thin rivulet between his eyes and down his face from a wound atop his skull. From where I was, I could see an indentation high on his head, and immediately knew it was a blow inflicted from the axe he toted. When he saw me, he smiled menacingly, and his hand gripped the weapon tighter. Thanks for shutting the window. It was too cold. Well, I hope you enjoyed that one, my dear, dear friends. And the introductory poem, In the Dark, by E. L. Mauser. Both that and the main story were from Dr. Creepin's Vault. Now, I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you've got a story and you think you'd like me to read it, stick it in the vault. And who knows, maybe one day I'll actually get round to it. Well, my dear friends, that's it for this evening. Sweet dreams, remember. 
These are only stories. I'll see you again real soon, but for now, bye-bye.